Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Um, I see you've already enjoyed our presentation so far. I'm waiting a few minutes. Uh, we're talking today about curing a 15-year-old disease. Um, you go on. And this is our disease, I guess. Um, <laughs> It's a very painful disease. As we found out during our research, we're going to be talking about Visual Basic 6 executables, or more specifically about reverse engineering of Visual Basic 6 executables, which turned out to be a real headache. That's why we decided to call it a disease. Right. My name is Marion Marschleck. I work for Cyford Incorporated, which is a startup in the United States. And I'm Jurian. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I work on uh, Kuka Sandbox as one of the developers, and I do some freelance work. Um, so, welcome. All right, now after our glorious startup, I hope everyone's just as excited as we are about the topic. And we're going to start up with the uh, jump back in time. I don't know how many people in here are actually, oh, let's start the other way. How many people in here didn't ever see Minesweeper? Is there anyone here who never played Minesweeper? Oh my god, this is true. <laughs> awesome. Ah, uh, yeah. Actually, I admit I grabbed that screenshot from the interweb somewhere. I haven't seen Minesweeper myself in a while, but it's actually something people should know. Um, yeah, we're back in the 1990s. This screenshot is from uh, Windows uh, 95 desktop. And with Visual Basic 6, we're almost in the same era. We're back in 1998, when Visual Basic 6 was first released from Microsoft. It's a, it was one of the, the first languages for really easily develop GUI applications, which are mainly uh, object-based, event-driven applications. And, well, the interesting thing about Visual Basic 6 is that it was declared unsupported in 2008 and replaced by .NET as a development language, which is particularly interesting because well, also the era of Visual Basic 6 malware should actually be over. Um, I think to declare it unsupported in 2008 was a step by Microsoft to try to actually get rid of a disease they created their own. And they didn't really manage up until today. So today we're telling you about Visual Basic 6 executables as they're still around and still causing a lot of headache. Actually, when saying Visual Basic 6 is dead, we find out that Google actually agrees with us. In preparing this talk, I was searching for the Wikipedia page explaining what Visual Basic 6 should be like. Um, and searching for <laughs> Visual Basic 6, I actually rather found a diet called Vegan Before 6, which in the top results that Google gives you when you search Ruby 6 is um, four out of six entries. So for me, that was a proof that Visual Basic 6 is actually really sort of dead. But, well, let's start at the beginning, right? Visual Basic 6 is great for writing malware, as it's really, really hard to analyze, really hard to reverse engineer. But it's actually kind of not, not very usual to use an object-driven language to create malware, as it is kind of a pain already to develop. But there were some malwares out in the wild actually being pretty successfully infecting machines back in 2000, or actually from 2000 to 2010. The first very well-known uh, creature of the sort was the Pikachu worm in 2000, which basically used the nice term Pikachu as your friend to get people to click a link which would download a specific executable a, when the person executed that executable, it would try to delete the Windows directory or the System32 directory. And actually people say that this swarm died out pretty fast solely because it was so badly coded and had so many bugs in there that it wouldn't run correctly when infecting machines. But that was not the last malware, as I mentioned. There was a second one in 2005 that kept the antivirus industry busy. It was called Calver and spread through Amazon Messenger, also sending out links telling people to install a specific piece of software. And interesting enough, it was just out there to download further malware. So it would spread like a worm, but later on infect the machine with a different piece of malware. And 
the theories go that with BV6, you're just a little bit limited in terms of developing malware, while with C or C++, you have way more possibilities to infect the system. That's why it was used as a downloader. And the third creature that we could show you, which was out in 2000s, was the change of worm, which was actually a similar model. It was also a worm spreading through the network and downloading different executables to infect the system. This one was particularly interesting for me as I, in my short career, worked for a company who had an incident with exactly that malware in their network. As some of you know, I was working for an antivirus company before. They regularly have interesting incidents concerning malware. And specifically interesting about that piece of malware was that it would spread through company shares. It would place executables on shares with a folder icon, much likely to the one on the screen here, and therefore lure people into double-clicking that folder to see what's in there and infect further systems by executing upon there. But so saying all of these were in the 2000s, like you might know that after 2010, there was no more very mentionable widespread worm infection anywhere. After I think the config of worm, worms were pretty much dying out due to different reasons. And while the same, the same is accountable for Visual Basic 6 malware, like for the last few years, we haven't seen any widespread Visual Basic 6 malware anymore. But what's out there now is Visual Basic cryptors who not necessarily do evil things, but protect evil executables from being analyzed. So um, when I'm telling you now that Visual Basic 6 malware is not there anymore, you might ask why we're still here. Uh, we found out that Visual Basic 6, sadly, is not dead yet. It's still out and around and kicking and keeping people busy. You will find out throughout this presentation that there's a very high lack or a very high demand of analysis tools or helpers to dissect Visual Basic 6 malware, which is just not present yet. But we truly believe that they will be necessary in the future. Our research centered on the analysis of a specific cryptor, which was developed some years ago by, I don't know which, Russian or Eastern European script kitty, which basically takes a standard custom malware and wraps it into a Visual Basic 6 cryptor, which is capable of adding anti-analysis features, like a big palette of anti-analysis features, which would then target a sandbox or specific antivirus products or specific other online analysis platforms. And doing this, having a wrapper, which is really hard to analyze, and adding anti-analysis features, which makes it even impossible to have a short peek in, into this piece of malware, makes it a very dangerous technique. Right. So um, a 101 Visual Basic 6. Uh, Visual Basic 6 was, well, Visual Basic was invented in 1991. Um, by Microsoft, obviously. Um, and then in 1998, uh, Visual Basic 5 and 6 were released. And this was the latest version of Visual Basic 6 um, that has actually been released. Nowadays, you have .NET. And it's much, um, so .NET is, there's a lot of tools for .NET to analyze it. And for Visual Basic 6, which has been created and released 15 years ago, there's actually not a lot of tools, and that's why we focus on it today. Uh, so this is an example of native code. Uh, so there are two options in Visual Basic 6 when you compile. One option is to create native code, and one option is to create pseudocode. And in this native code example, uh, you can see a simple hello world on the right, and basically it just uh, calls a message box and shows hello world. Um, then we have the pseudocode. So to compare, um, we have readable x86 assembly. I'm sure, not sure if everyone here knows x86, but it's beautiful, right? It's like a novel compared to the other stuff. At least you can read it. And then we have the pseudocode, the P code, and basically you get this stuff. Um, yeah. So you do this one. 
Yes, so the pseudocode basically it's there's nothing readable. It's like one byte after another, which later on gets translated by the MSVBVM6T.dll, the VB6 virtual machine, which is a DLL that gets loaded with every VB6 executable and does nothing else than taking the bytecode from the executable and translating it to VB6 mnemonic, yeah, right, that word for opcode, and calls a <laughs> specific handler which applies to the specific mnemonic. Um, this whole process is, in principle, really simple, but in fact, if you have a bunch of bytecode and try to figure out what it's doing, it is really hard to translate it to useful information. This is specifically for one single fact, which is Microsoft never took the chance to actually document their VB6 mnemonics. So you have like some hundreds of opcodes that apply for VB6 executables, for VB6 P codes, which are not documented. There is a very sparse documentation on the VB6 translation tables, which we will talk about today, which just lists all the possible opcodes and their index in the translation tables, which sometimes gives you a hint what this opcode is actually doing, just based on its name but you can't call it the documentation. So you can actually translate the P code back to its mnemonics, but then you still have to figure out what the mnemonics do, which is why I said before, like x86 is like a novel. You can actually figure out what the opcodes are doing with P code, that's not the case. So what you see in this graphic here, for a short introduction, is upside a peek in the, into the P code and how this byte stream of pseudocode is fed into six different tables inside of the VB6 VM. And these tables it is translated to call into the right handler for the, for the specific instruction that is executed. So every instruction has a dedicated handler inside of the virtual machine. Right. So um, to add to that, um, so we have the official basic 6 virtual machine DLL. And there's lots of exported functions like uh, for example, the RTC message box you see here on the, bo on the bottom. But uh, if you Google any of these instructions, or any of these functions, the only hits you will get is like virus.virustotal.com and like uh, for strings. But there's like no documentation at all. And as Marianne already told, there's about 800 instructions, um, of, which, of which only a few hundred are actually used. In, uh, in compiled P code, and the only thing we found was like a listing of opcodes and their index. And some Russian comments, right. uh, Russian comments on the, on the listing. Uh, so here you see the function called proc call engine. Uh, proc call engine is basically when a feature basic six method is um, executed, uh, you give like the data structure to this function, and it's like it calls the procedure. procedure. And then um, we use this proc call engine function because it's exported, so we can uh, get the address. And then in the bottom, you see the table 00. zero. That's the first lookup table, one of the six. And from this table, um, uh, you see it on the right. Uh, you see a, fu a table function pointers. So there's 256 function pointers in there. And at the very end, you see uh, handlers for uh, getting into the other five tables. So when you have um, a one byte opcode, it goes directly into the first jump table. But if you have a two byte opcode, then it first looks up the second um, jump table and then goes, uh, then looks the function pointer up from there. So that's how it has like 800 uh, function pointers and instructions. Um, here you see an, inst an instruction handler. Uh, this is an example which push, pushes an integer on the stack. Um, so what you see is uh, I've highlighted, highlighted ESE here. ESE points to the bytecode. So all the time uh, the ESE pointer is looked up for uh, which instruction it is and which data there is. So this instruction takes five bytes. Uh, one is for uh, the opcode and four for a 32-bit integer. And um, 
So, and then when the instruction has pushed the integer onto the stack, uh, the EC pointer is increased by five and the next lookup value is um, used to jump to the next uh, instruction. Here you see, uh, so the first instruction is move AEX from the value at pointer EC and this basically loading a 32-bit integer f um, from the bytecode, so from the instruction, and then it pushes it onto the stack, and that's basically everything this instruction does. So there's hundreds of these instructions, and the only way to identify them is by <coughs> looking at the name, which you get from the opcodes listing, and by reverse engineering it. So for our tool, which we will get into later, uh, I reverse engineered all the instruction handlers that I thought were interesting, and based on that I can say, okay, for this instruction, if I want to have the immediate value, like the, the value that's pushed onto the stack, then I have to look at the 32-bit integer right behind the opcode. And, yeah. So, this is uh, a hello world. We prepared a short example to show you in practice how the translation would look like, or actually how the binary itself would look like inside. And I dug out my phenomenal uh, programming skills in VB6 and managed to write a message box, which was a pretty hard job because first I had to find the uh, the IDE for, for Visual Basic, which as it was like out of support in 2008 was not easy. I also doubt it's legal still to download and install. No, I, uh, we get this message box up and, and running and everything it does is popping up a hello world and then you can click OK and the application ends. So we're going to have a look at the handler of this one single button in the application. Um, let's start with the decompilation. We might have mentioned before there's a decompiler for VB6 B-code, which works more or less good but shows kind of weird obfuscated stuff. Anyway, here you see the handler, which consists of nothing else than end. This is the only instruction that I wrote in there. It ends the application. And if you load this example into your either pro or your preferred disassembler or debugger, you will see this piece of x86 code and a lot of data. So everything that the application does for starting up is loading the header of the VB6 executable that you can see up there, pushing it on stack, and then calling the thunrt main function, which will execute the VB6 executable. Here's a short screenshot of the mentioned data before. Actually, there are some very useful scripts for either Pro, which you can download from OpenRC, I think, that can split up the Visual Basic 6 header for you and aid it with comments to the different objects that are in, inside of the header. But if we have a closer look now on the header, or more importantly, the offset that's pushed onto the stack for Thunder Main, it shows you the header structures and with a little bit of Googling and looking up custom documentation, you can find out which pointers are pointing you through the executables. It's important to understand that Visual Basic is event-driven, so basically what you have is objects and events. So you have like an object, which would be a button, which is waiting for an event. There would be someone clicking the button, which then calls into a handler executing the code that's associated with the button. So reverse engineering this, you have to identify all the different objects inside of the tables that are located in the header to identify the associated events and the associated handlers for the events for the objects. So going through there, through these data structures, you have a nice walk down through this executable. Did I mention it just only has one single instruction? But you have to walk down all the header to finally locate the offset of the handler of this one button inside of the application, which is in this box down here, the 418B0, which then looks like this. So this is all the code that's actually executed in this application, and everything else is just added for getting the application to start. And here you can see how the script, thankfully, already translated the P code to useful mnemonics, and it shows you it calls an AND instruction, which consists of four bytes and, sorry, two bytes, and the exit proc h result instruction, which consists of one byte. So these three bytes are all the code that's inside of the executable. It was amazing. So 
classical ana analysis approaches. Uh, so before, um, so we were look at looking at the sample and we were trying other uh, ways to analyze it and basically they don't work. So we found some existing tools or projects. Uh, there is the VB decompiler. It's a decompiler, so basically it translates, it tries to translate the P code back into readable visual basic six code. Uh, we tried the Tequila debugger, which is um, a debugger made by some Spanish guys 10 years ago. Um, it works, but it also crashes some from time to time. It's interesting how the debugger 10 years ago is still the most accurate tool that's available. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have the IDA script, which we just showed. And then there are some guys who uh, did a lot of work on Fisher Basic 6, but they didn't release it publicly. So it's probably somewhere in an AV company, I guess. Um, not nothing you can find on the internet publicly, at least. So we introduce you to you the most advanced, sophisticated, private, cloud-based, big data intelligence cyber solution. That's a trademark. Um. Yeah, we basically came up with our own idea of how to tackle visual basic executables. But we started this research basically back in October last year. Uh, we first found the problem in October last year, and we tried a lot for analyzing these executables. Like we, we got our hands on three samples of um, encrypted message boxes of this specific crypto I mentioned before, and seriously tried a lot. I now will lead you through the fail compilation of all the classical analysis approaches that we tried and why they failed, why they were not successful. We started, of course, off with the dynamic analysis in different sandboxes, in virtual machines, even in real machines. And anything, any data that we grabbed out of there wouldn't actually tell us what the crypto did. So our goal was not necessarily to analyze the message box pop-up that came out afterwards, but the crypto that was wrapped around the message box. And any data that we grabbed from the dynamic approach was just a lot. Like, this crypto would add a lot of activity. I'll show you later on, it will also add a lot of garbage code for um, rendering static analysis. But also for dynamic analysis, it produced a lot of crap. Like, how you can see on the screenshot, it would start more than 100 threads and exit them again for very few reason. Um, the next step that we tried after dynamic analysis didn't tell us what the crypto does was decompilation. Of course, as we mentioned, there is a decompiler out there on the market, which actually does a pretty good job in decompiling applications. So if you have a non-obfuscated, non-crypted uh, sample from VB6 P code, you will most likely be happy with this decompiler because it can produce rather beautiful visual basic code, um, which doesn't apply to encrypted and obfuscated sample with more than 80% of garbage code in there. So we also did spend a lot of time inside this decompiler without actually figuring out what the code was doing. Uh, we tried with massive advanced static analysis on the code and trying to figure out our way through the encrypted sample. And actually, the tree I painted there was uh, ending pretty soon as there were no more functions called and no more interesting parameters passed and no more handlers registered and no exceptions happening and no, uh, nothing interesting going on. So actually also this static analysis didn't get us very far in our, in our job as analysis. And of course, we tried by debugging the sample, which after all was most of the fun of the analysis. Um, there might be some fans of either pro in here, and I don't want to insult any one of these, but actually I was really, really disappointed using either pro and Visual Basic 6. Well, let me get to this in a second. So we tried debugging. Now you might think that debugging is actually a good idea on any sort of executable because you really get to see step by step what's happening in there, which you have to imagine doesn't apply to VB6 P code because everything that you're debugging is the VB6 virtual machine that is grabbing bytecode from the executable and trying to translate it and call a handler afterwards. So what you would have to do for successfully debugging 
these applications is reverse engineer all the handlers that are called and figure out how they interact with each other, which is a never ending job. So we tried some more debugging without reversing the virtual machine and encountered a, of course, not just only the P code in the sample, but a lot of protection. As this was a cryptor, it had anti debug, it had garbage code, it was obfuscated. It probably had a bunch of other anti-features too, including an anti-cuckoo feature. And this all was really a very messed up situation, handling it in a debugger. As I encountered a lot of exceptions in there. I think we have one more exception. Right. So I think it was two weeks ago when I finally uh, tried the IDA Pro debugger, which so far was my favorite, I have to say, on the Hello World sample to finally see how it would look like on a real world sample and guess what the debugger crashed. Which brought me to the conclusion that maybe it's not the cryptor giving trouble to IDA Pro, but IDA Pro itself. So trying to execute a P code hello world in IDA Pro wouldn't work. Oh, we're still not sure which of the exceptions would happen in IDA Pro or would happen caused by the cryptor. Anyway. We didn't give up on debugging and eventually found a way not to analyze the cryptor, but to bypass it. So together we came up with a trick to patch the sample to load a customized kernel 32, namely a kernel 33 DLL, which would contain breakpoints on all the points inside of the executable where it could eventually start a sub process containing the final message box, which eventually was successful putting a breakpoint on resume thread. So we figured out the sample would unpack the encrypted sample at some point, create a new process, and then call resume thread API call to start the, the unpacked executable. So patching the custom DLL with a breakpoint on that API call would eventually halt the whole process make it possible to attach a debugger after all the anti-debugging or whatever anti-analysis was happening. And we would be able to get hold of the final executable. But this would still not tell us what the actual cryptor was doing, which was the object of our headache. So we tried a bit more on voodoo magic and finally came up with an idea of how to actually kick the ass of that cryptor. Yeah. So basically, we tried all kinds of things. And all the approaches we took didn't really work, so you start working on your own tool, which leads us back to the most advanced, sophisticated, private cloud-based big data intelligence cyber solution. Still a trademark, by the way, but it doesn't say it in the slide. So uh, what are you interested in when you're looking at a malware sample and it's trying to avoid like debuggers and cuckoo sandbox and other stuff? Um, personally, I'm interested in what is in, in executed. So um, you can see like, uh, for example, uh, with some of the approaches, we saw lots of create thread things, lots of crea threads created, but that doesn't really tell you much, just that the thread has been created. Um, so if you have all access to all the instructions that have been executed, uh, then you can, based on that, do analysis and see, okay, this was done here, and this function was called here, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's one of the, our goals. Uh, we also want to like monitor events. So like if a file is created, which actually is not happening, but if it would be created, we would like to follow it or see what the content, contents are, et cetera. And most importantly, we want to see uh, strings, memory, and x86 code, um, which is being ran and executed at runtime. So especially strings are interesting because for example, um, Sometimes uh, these kind of tools would uh, uh, enumerate all the processes and see if like Python is loaded, for example, and if it is, then they don't, they don't run. So in this case, it would be useful to see like the string Python in there, so you can know, okay, Python is running, it's not working. So these are the goals of our tool, and I will now go a little bit into how we've developed it and what it does and how it does. So to c come back to the earlier um, six jump tables, the function pointer tables that Marian talked about, um, 
basically what we want to do is we want to instrument every instruction. That's, what, that, that's how we started out. So we want to instrument every instruction and therefore get like, um, see every instruction that's executed and uh, log it to a file. So basically um, dump all the instruction names while they're executed and then executing uh, also the virtual machine code and just logging everything to a file. So we did that. Um, so we got like a log file which is a few hundred megabytes I think. And it's just filled with instruction names. And if you then sort it and uh, take like counts of the instruction names, you see that for example, uh, an instruction as load string is used 10,000 times and I don't know. So based on this, um, we found that there is actually from the 800 unique instructions, there's only around 200 being used in this particular sample. And we were like going through the logs, like to see which instructions are used. And then we saw like, okay, open file, uh, load string, uh, color function, and decided that these are interesting because they actually might represent what, what is happening. Because for example, if, if you have two integers that are being added to each other and you get one plus one is two, that's not really interesting at the moment. So we made some statistics and found a few dozen instructions which, um, which, for which we wrote specific instruction handlers. So for example, for the open file instruction, we have like a small function uh, which uh, just dumps the file name of the, of the file that's being opened. Um, so here in the bottom, you see two handlers, one for XOR variable and one for XOR variant actually, and one for loading an integer. Uh, it's just some C code with some macros, so it's like pretty dense. But it shows like, okay, for this instruction, um, we report this, so the, the, the instruction name and the value that's being refer referenced. So uh, then we get to how we patch the function handlers, because you cannot just, just patch this and it, it will crash. Uh, so we started by, um, by making a copy of all of, uh, all the function pointers. And then basically what you do is you replace the function pointers in those six jump tables with our function, function pointers, and which is basically just an assembly stuff um, which uh, calls our own reporting function. So these two little guys here. And then after this function is executed, it goes back to the original code. So it, it just adds a little bit of our code within there. And uh, based on that, we can instrument the whole thing. So to do that, um, we store the current state of the virtual machine. Then we call this function. Uh, we give some registers. So as you can see here on the bottom, it says ESI. So that's actually a reference of the ESI re register, which contains the bytecode. And uh, you also see ESP on the handle above. It's basically just a pointer to the stack. Um, so in, the re in these handlers, you can do anything you want. Uh, you, can s you can even modify strings if, you if you'd like to do that. We don't modify anything. We just, uh, we just inter interpret and lock at the moment, but it's possible. And then uh, afterwards, the original state is restored and uh, we jump to the or original handler and life goes on. So that's basically the internals of our tool. And as you could already see here with the reporting function, uh, we have some, we made like a printf-like function which e makes it easier to dump all the information that we would like to dump for our tool. So for example, um, actually in particular, in Visual Basic 6 you have two uh, data types. One is B string. It's uh, a Unicode string, but, and it has this length prepended. So normally this would be, you, you, um, if you want to dump this with a normal printf, then you have some, you have, you have to like dereference the pointer, get the length, and blah, blah. So we made our own printf, which you can see again here. And um, it has like sp specific uh, format string uh, thingies to handle these cases. So you see percent V uh, in, the t in the upper uh, handler, handler. And this one dumps variant uh, pointers. 
and variant is basically a generic wrapper around any kind of uh, value. So it can contain integers, it can contain a character or a pointer or a string or even another variant type. And we just dump whatever is in there according to its type. Um, and then we have a custom hex dump. It's just a wrapper around the printf thing. Um, so you give the memory address and a comment like, okay, this is from this, this thing. And it dumps, it gives a, like a nice hex dump. And um, everything that is um, executed, uh, I mean, everything that's reported, um, it basically goes into the log file where we get to now. So. Yeah, so the infamous log file in the beginning, I think we started off with 115 megabytes of log file, which you have to imagine are single lines with opcodes, which were, I think, at about 166 million entries, which is A, connected to the massive overhead that Visual Basic 6 produces for the CPU, and B, connected to the cryptor, which adds overhead to the overhead and tries to do as much as possible to hide the few things that it's actually doing. So for automating creation of that log file, um, we used the Cuckoo sandbox to generate and extract the log files for us to at least save the work for copying the executable and the DLL for every execution that we wanted to do. So we cuckooified our approach and just exchanged the DLL that Cuckoo would usually inject into a running process with the custom DLL that we wrote to monitor the VB program. And also adapted Cuckoo to extract the log file that was written inside of the Visual Basic machine, uh, inside of the virtual machine. And grabbing out these log files, we spent afterwards a lot of time for looking into the millions and millions of instructions that we found out there. Yeah, so basically, um, instead of using Cuckoo's DLL, which does other stuff, we place our DLL in the Cuckoo, repo in the Cuckoo project and then everything is executed inside the sandbox, inside the virtual machine, and we instruct Kuko to, uh, to bring the log file, which is created, back to the host for further analysis. Um, so basically, we found uh, somewhat funny results, uh, the disease, you know. Uh, so mostly we found uh, some obfuscation and garbage, like I, what, what you can see in the de decompiled code, there's lots of garbage in here. Um, it m doesn't make any sense. So there's a couple of anti cuckoo and anti blah blah features, and there's some other interesting stuff. So uh, there's like three ways to call external functions. The first one is the legitimate one. It's the int uh, import address table, and it's actually only related to the uh, feature basic six stuff itself. The malware doesn't actually use this stuff. Then there is dynamic, dynamically resolved functions. Uh, this is a feature in Visual Basic 6. But what the sample does, it like encrypts the function names and then decrypts it at runtime before resolving the symbol. So you get stuff like Wishum thread and set w write virtual memory and that exit code that exit code thread, which like you can see somewhat what, what the name is, means because only one character in difference with the original one. But it, I thought it was funny. You were funny wondering truth. about the string obfuscation that the author of the cryptor actually intended as he's just like replacing one letter in a word that might change any hash result of an executable, but actually doesn't make the API name unreadable. Yeah, so uh, there are some other interesting stuff. Uh, the sample executes x86 code from within the P code. And it does this by, um, th so this is part of the log file. Maybe a bit dark, but I hope you can, yeah, you can, read, it, can read it. So at the very top, you see um, highlighted 8B, 4C, something, something. This is actually hex encoded x86 assembly. Uh, so what they do is they, they construct like a hex string, then, de 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 uh, then unhex it, put it on the stack, and call it. And at the, top, at the bottom, you see uh, disassembling something on the stack, 
from the function this v call h result. They use this function to call x86 they just graphed it. And in this case it does like uh, get current process ID. So it gets the process ID. And so, so with this technique, uh, like executing x86 at runtime, they try to avoid um, static detection, static analysis de um, things, because um, yeah, because you're you're analyzing a, a P code binary, and then all of a sudden, at sudden at runtime, it executes x86. So you, uh, I wrote the simple disassembler, as you can see, and it automatically dumps all these x86 blobs. It's quite funny. So yeah, the um, the log file is pretty big, as we already said. So analyze all the things. Uh, try to try to get rid of all the garbage, which is kind of hard, I guess. And then there's something uh, something else peculiar. Uh, so at some point they make uh, they have a stop for create thread, and then they use create thread to create a new thread, just to call one function. So in this case, it's uh, they call enum processes, uh, which you can see on the right here. So the hundred threads that, threads that are created that we saw earlier, it's just one function call every time. And just obfuscation way, I guess. So um, our initial goal was to find out um, w how they implement anti cuckoo feature because it doesn't run on the cuckoo. And this has yet to be uh, identified. But uh, we have lots of logs now and we're on it and I'm sure we'll find it ev eventually. We're now working on an automated text analysis approach to work through the log files. Anyway, the things we found out about the crypto is that it's a headache. Did we mention that DB6 is a headache? I'm not sure if you understood that message. Uh, the crypto itself is really just only a wrapper that will eventually, after hundreds of threads and two different sub-processes, call the original executable that was packed with it. The packer itself starts off as a VV6 executable. Inside of this executable, it creates a new thread, a uh, new process. Into this process, it will unpack a third executable, if you will say so, which is another C or C++ coded sample, I'm not sure, which is packed with PE compact, so it's actually readable, x86. Um, in the second step, which then eventually, after unpacking inside of memory, will have the final executable unpacked and call into the packed executable. So the VB6 wrapper itself is like one layer of Visual Basic 6 with Visual Basic 6 wrapped anti-analysis features, one layer of PE compact, we're not yet sure if it's an original P compact or a customized version. And then finally, unpack the original executable. So, in a nutshell, uh, we created the tool for analyzing Visual Basic 6 stuff. Uh, the project is currently not online yet. I, I guess I will do it soon. If somebody gives me some beer, maybe, it, maybe I'll do it faster. Um, thank you for joining. Hope you liked it. Oh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for being here.